Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Haggai 2, 4 through 7. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, Jesus, I love you. Thank you um, that we get to be in this building. We get to praise your name freely. Lord, I pray um, in our lives, your glory is on display. Um, I pray that when we make it um, about you, that you shine even greater. When we make it about us, you continue to shine. Um, Lord, this church is yours. These people are yours. Um, We give you all the honor. You can have a seat. Well, how are we? (laughs) Tony, how are we? (laughs) She's like, not good now (laughs) that you call me out. Yeah, okay, it's fine. Uh, I know, the sermon's early this morning. Everyone's trying to find a seat. (laughs) Uh, We have communion at the end, which is going to be fantastic. So thank you, ushers, for... Uh, if there is any room next to you, uh, that'd be great. We're wonderfully full, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, uh, we are finishing up Haggai uh, this morning, uh, which makes me sad because it's such a great book and there's much more that I'd, I'd want to dig into. But for this morning, we're just going to cap it uh, with, uh, uh, with, week, with week three here. And um, uh, to, begin the, uh, to begin the message, I'm going to talk about... Uh, a moment where uh, expectations and reality uh, collided <laughs> in a big way, in a good way. Not, not at first, but then it became and has become uh, great. And that was when we were in uh, Wisconsin. And we were up there and uh, we were, uh, got pregnant and went to the, our doctor appointment. And the doctor made an offhand comment uh, kind of at the, uh, at the end of our appointment, said, hey, just one more thing. When you go to the ultrasound tomorrow, if it's, if it's twins, I can't be your doctor because you need a twin doctor. And it just flew over my head. You know, I remember him saying it more the day after, uh, but I was just like, oh, man. I, mean, I think I did say to Emily, like, can you even imagine? Uh, and uh, just, you know, we all have moments like that where then God's like, you, you cannot imagine. <laughs> uh, you're about to find out. So the next day we go to the, uh, the hospital for an ultrasound to just kind of that first check. And uh, we're in the, in the room with the dim lighting and they bring out the glue thing and the, you know, the stuff. And I'm clearly a doctor and I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I have no idea. But it was like, the, I felt like, like the movies. I'm like, this is my life though now. Like, but this is what I've seen. I'm about to find out, like, see my uh, son or daughter. And like a half second before the nurse said uh, something that just like absolutely changed my, my life, I saw these two... Uh, uh, circles, basically. And there was a half second where I just was like, <gasps> and uh, then, um, then the nurse, she goes, there's two. And my wife, um, my wife goes, two what? <laughs> <laughs> two, 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 it's so, just so like a, um, there are two what? Two feet? Two what? We already see two eyes? This is good. This, why would we even say anything about that? It's normal. And uh, then she was like, uh, uh, two, you know, two babies. And then Emily goes, you're joking. And she goes, ma'am, I'm legally not allowed to joke about that. They're two babies. <laughs> and I was like, all right, just bring it down. Okay, we're just trying to recover here. Okay, uh, this is like uh, not what we expected. And uh, I, I, I was not the guy that wanted twins. I, you know, for, I just thought... The first uh, child out the gate would be one son, you know, heir to the throne, all of these things. I'm a third, uh, so maybe we'll have the fourth, Robert Doyle McClanagan, the fourth, which I think then he would need a castle once we get into IV. Yeah, it starts to get over the top, dude. Um, but that was, just, that was my expectation. And uh, I wish that I still had the picture that my wife and I took in the waiting room before we got all the stuff we left with, because uh, I'll just be honest, and it's kind of funny, but also like it was just true. Uh, not what we wanted. 
Like just it, my mind went to how hard it's going to be, how difficult it's going to be. None of my friends at the time had twins. And I was like, why us? Why us, Lord? I know it's a gift. I'm so thankful. I know it can be so hard to have kids, um, but we're already in Wisconsin, and now we have two. Now we have two kids. Like, I have no clue. The jump to one feels like, you know, just warp speed, much less two. And so we were just, I mean, not in a good place, and uh, it was just not what we expected. Obviously, a huge uh, life, uh, life change, and of course, now has as all so many things that happen in life, which starts off in, in just this insane place, God works together for good. Uh, and it is, it, is, uh, it is so good. Um, and the, the heart of the message this morning is, um, what do you do when the life that you expect it to have is not the life that you do have? Uh, and the things you thought were going to happen in your life, the older you get and the more that you cross the date when it has not happened yet, you then begin to like have this deep down thought of like, maybe it actually is not going to happen. Uh, and the dreams that you had and the visions that you had and the things that you just thought, well, I'll get at some point. And then at some point it becomes, I don't, I don't know when, I don't know how, what is God doing? I did think the trajectory for my life was not maybe going to be up and to the right, but in following Jesus, I just everything works together for my good, right? I don't quite understand how this can be part of my good. And for the people um, in the book of Haggai, there's this moment where they've built the new temple, and it is a far cry from the old temple. And their expectations of what it was supposed to be get confronted with the reality that it's not nearly as great or as beautiful, or as massive as the first one. And in the beginning of Haggai chapter 2, this is what Haggai writes. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Which is this allusion to many, uh, Haggai included, there were many, many thousands of people who had seen the previous temple. And it was unbelievable. And they're looking at this temple and they're thinking, that, like, this is what we've built, Yahweh? What does it say about us? Our hearts, our love, our devotion. Like, the, he's going to dwell in, in this house? And you just, you have that moment where it's like, this is not what we expected. This is not what was. This is not what we thought would be. And this is the phrase, it's, so, it's an intense phrase. How do you see now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes in comparison to what was? This is a far, uh, a far cry from the glory that was Solomon's temple. And a lot of pain and brokenness and misery has happened since that temple was destroyed. And now all we have is, in a sense, this house? Hmm. Ezra, which tracks kind of the history of this time, after they dedicate the, the foundation of the temple, there's this unique couple verses here. Ezra writes, And all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and head of the father's houses, old men who'd seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. And not tears of joy, tears of grief tears of loss, tears of we've waited all this time for this. Unmet expectations. The people of God are no strangers to that in the Bible, much less are you and I. The people of God uh, had 400 years of slavery in Egypt and groaning and groaning and groaning, and it'd be easy to just jump through that. But for God's chosen people, his beloved people, to be under the empire of Egypt for so long must be thinking, this doesn't seem like plan A, it seems like plan B, plan C. And then when God delivers them and, and hears their groaning and hears their cry, he, he delivers them, then what happens not long after they've left, is they're just like, we want to go back. Because this is not what we expected. It, we, the routines and the rhythms and the food of, uh, of Egypt were actually better than this, even though they weren't. But in your mind, you begin to just think different things. And so they say to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to bury you? That's tough to lead people when that's kind of how they're operating. <laughs> it's like, at least we had food in Egypt. Now we have nothing. 
we're God's chosen people. Yeah, great that he saved us, but to what? Why can't we get to the promised land today? Was 400 years not long enough? Now we got to keep walking? I love what Gideon says um, when God comes to him in Judges 6. I said this in week one. One of my favorite little passages in Scripture become more precious to me the last couple years. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And I love the honesty of that. I love that it's in the scriptures. Because you have God's okay with it. He's okay with honesty. He's okay with you keeping it real. He knew that Gideon would say that, knew it would be in his word, knew it would be preached today, thousands of years later, as an encouragement to all of us. Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, and I think how I understood him being with us, I don't understand how it means um, that we are uh, in exile and in, and in bondage and we're suffering and we're filled with wounds. I don't help me understand God being with us and God loving us with actually what I'm experiencing in my life. What happened to all the things he did in Egypt? Or what happens to the things he's done in our lives for other people? What about for us? What about for me, I Lord? I think of Job or Ruth, or Jonah, or Daniel. Men or women who I think could say, I had this going differently for me when God called me. I wouldn't have thought this was the route that it, that it was going to take. I thought, um, yeah, no, Lord, I trust you. I believe in you. I didn't think that you would take everything from me. I don't understand how that... Um, this is how God works. And it's true for us as well. Our lives are filled with expectations that run up against reality and can leave us wondering, is this the way, Lord? Are you really with us? I, I didn't expect to still be single uh, at my age. Just been praying, been praying, been praying, been knocking, been knocking, been knocking, and, and the Christmas card, and the life, and my friends, and here I am. And I love you, and I'm, I'm without a family. I didn't expect to ever get divorced. Uh, I knew the pastor said it, but I didn't expect for marriage to be this hard. <laughs> Not really. I didn't expect for cancer to be part of my story or for my son or my daughter to have this condition or disease. I didn't expect to lose my mom when I was so young. I didn't expect how unfulfilled I would be when I got everything that I actually wanted. I didn't expect trying to have a baby would be filled with so much pain. I didn't expect not to get that job, not to get that promotion, not to be doing the job that I never really even wanted to do. Now what do I do? I didn't expect for my child raised in the church to not want anything to do with the church. And speaking of church, I didn't expect for the church to be a place where I actually experienced a lot of hurt and pain. Come to think of it, when I think about my, my life, I actually didn't expect any of it. And I certainly don't, wouldn't have wanted most of it. And so when expectations are shattered and they're lying on the floor in pieces, what remains? Him. Him. Uh, when everything gets stripped from us, uh, when there's no more provision, 
we have the, the thing that we need most, which is his presence. That's what we have. That's the promise. That's it. It's him. It's him. It's him. It's him. It's him. Because you know who expected everything to happen in your life? Jesus. Nothing has ever caught him by surprise. He knows. And in fact, not only does he know, it is part of his plan to make you like his son and to bring him glory. Amen. Amen. This is the message of Haggai, uh, this sense of they're looking at the temple and they're, they're thinking, uh, this, this, is, this is it. And then God responds in power and glory and beauty. And this is what God says of all the things he could encourage them with. Verse 4, yet now be strong, because clearly there is some, uh, some drooping of hearts and drooping of, of limbs, just this sense of loss. God says, be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, labor, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant, the promise that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Now that is a word thundered from the heavens, but as personal as it gets. Be, be strong. Uh, God says it three times to, to, to the, uh, the organizational and spiritual leaders. You have to be strong. To all the remnant of the people, you have to be strong. To take courage. Literally in the Hebrew, um, it, it of course doesn't mean be strong in yourself. It means to be bound up, to be actually to be binded to someone else and to find strength because you're bound to them. Well, that sounds like strength from the Lord. And in your weakness, actually, you bind yourself to the Lord and his strength, and you find out you have strength, you have courage. Another definition of it is to hold fast, to be strong, to hold fast. And so we see in Hebrews, other parts of Scripture where hold fast. God is saying, I know it's hard. I know you look at the temple, you look at your life, you see the ruins, you see the broken places. I just want to encourage you, be strong. Because I may not fix this. I may not change that. The circumstances of, circumstances of your life may not change. In fact, they may even get worse. Here's what will remain. It is me. I am with you. You hold fast. You be strong in me. And what we find is when our dreams get shattered and suffering comes and pain comes, God pours out more of himself to fill up the holes in our heart. Yeah, I know many of you, you know it. You could testify this morning, couldn't you? I know you could. And it's not that only that he's with us, but it gives us courage to work there in the end of verse four. Work, labor, build, live your life, press in, don't, don't press out, keep going, full heart, whole heart. I am with you. That's the power you can do it. It's a lot to rebuild. It's a lot to restore. It's a lot to just, life is so hard. It's hard with Christ. It's hard with him living in us, much less without. God says, you keep building. You keep walking. You keep going. When you're walking through the valley, I, let me encourage you. You just keep going. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. And then God brings them back to the covenant. We talked about this last week with the identity, which is why it has to be so clear. Why did God save you? Why did God love you? Why did God deliver you? Because he wanted to, a people of his own possession, right? The law comes after they're liberated from Egypt. All the doing precedes being. And so he brings their hearts back when they're wondering, we've been in exile and our sin has brought us there. Our rebellion has brought us there. Has it been too much for God? Has it, he just, we've, we've done too much. He says, the promise I made to you was based on my faithfulness, not your obedience or lack thereof. Then there would be no promise kept if it was even mutual. And yeah, there are consequences for sin and there's brokenness in the world but I will not waver. I know what I'm doing. What a comforting thought. God's heart is to dwell with us 
God's heart is to dwell with us intimately and deeply and forever. You look at the storyline of the Bible, you see in the beginning, what is God's heart to dwell with people, to be with them? What shatters that? Sin and rebellion. But does the Bible end in Genesis chapter 3? Absolutely not. Is there this belief and this promise that one day someone is coming that can restore what we've lost? Yes. And you see it in the tabernacle where God's presence is with the people in the wilderness and the cloud and the fire. These reminders that God has not abandoned his people. And yes, it's mysterious. And yes, you're wondering like, well, okay, but still I don't understand in the fog. But there's the fire and there's the cloud. And then the temple, this, this location where God's presence is for the people. But the temple is great. It is not enough And so we have even more. Jesus Christ comes, the image of God. Why? To dwell with us, to be with us. So you don't have to just go to the temple or the tabernacle anymore. The temple, the tabernacle has come to you. We have access now to the Father, access to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, the love that he's poured out for us. He, he risked all of this and his life and his death that we would dwell with God. And now not only does we have Jesus beside us walking, but we have uh, Jesus inside of us, the Holy Spirit. That a thought that I know for many of us is like, I know that, I got that verse, but it's just the magnitude of it that he who raised the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I. And I'll add one more thing to it, okay? Dwells in you gladly and is happy to be at home in your heart. Now that's a thought I think sometimes we're like, ah, ooh, not supposed to be happy, got to be holy. It's like, yeah. Yeah course. (laughs) But God does want you to know and feel his love. And not just to know it through scripture, but to know it because of what you've walked through, which is why he walks us through the valley that we would go from knowing about to knowing. At the end of Job, Job says, I had heard about you and now my eyes have seen. My goodness. Not only does the Spirit dwell in us and does the Spirit manifest himself among us as we gather. And you know, it's why I love being with the church. As broken as it is, as crazy as it is, as wild as all the things, when we gather together as his corporate body, he delights to dwell and manifest his presence here. What a gift. But it gets even better. Because in the new heaven and new earth, Christ will be all be in all and will fill all with his presence, morning, noon, and night. And all we will know is intimacy and union and peace with him forever. So it began in the garden and it ends in the garden city of God in Revelation 21 and 22, where it says, now the dwelling place of God is with man. This has always been God's heart. I am with you. I am for you. Our challenge is in what happens in our life to have the strength through Christ to believe it. And I'll be the first to admit, easier preached than lived. But that's where the power is to hold fast. That, that's where it comes. You want to you hold fast? It comes from the promise of his presence. Not your... Um, Uh, being conditioned to the plan you think you have for your life because that plan will blow up multiple times because God loves you. God will give you more than you can handle so that in your ability to not handle it, you give it to to the one who can take it from you. Right, Colossians 1, uh, Paul says that Jesus Christ holds the entire cosmos together through his, basically through his fingers. Why? So I don't have to. So you don't have to, right? Christ right now is seated on the throne, relaxed. He's fine. And yet he knows all that's going on. And so we can, okay, I don't understand, but I trust the one who does. I don't hold, I I can't hold anything together. I'm thankful someone else does. That's where the courage to hold fast comes from. Can't hold fast to your willpower, can't hold fast to your life plan, can't hold fast to getting inspired by church on Sunday, can't hold fast to any of that. Hold fast to him. 
Hold fast to his presence. Not only though his presence, Haggai says, but his presence with us forever and his purpose in the pain, in the suffering, that greater glory is coming. Greater glory. It's going to be greater then than it even is now. And to have that hope shape the building, shape the labor, shape the work is absolutely essential to not just completely fall apart. And that's where Haggai turns. Six through nine of chapter two. This is the future promise of Christ's second coming. And they didn't even have the first coming yet. So they just so much is coming for them. They didn't know yet. Verse six, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while. That's where you're like, how long? (laughs) How long is a little, Lord? You know, one day is a thousand years to him. It's like, love it to be shorter. Love it, just come now, Lord, we're ready. Yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. It's gonna pour it into the kingdom of God. And I will fill this house, this, this temple, first with Christ, then with Christ's return, with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, everything's mine, it's all mine. And one day, every knee will bow and declare it. Verse nine, the latter glory, the coming glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, my goodness, not only do you have the assurance of his, of his, uh, his presence with us, and we know Emmanuel, Christ with us, Haggai says, not only is it, is it Christ with us in our suffering and our pain, but we have to be framed by future hope that we know it's all going somewhere that God actually does know what he's doing, that he's not wasting any part of our suffering. It's all plan A. There are no detours. You you have to believe that. You have to know that. As hard as it is, as challenging as it is, and many times you're like, there's no way. Coming back when everything is shattered to that which remains, which is Christ in us and Christ returning for us. I think uh, for the people there looking at the the temple, they they would have said, man, it was greater back then than it is now. And God is saying, you have no idea how great it's going to be. You have no idea how through your living stones and your broken pebbles, I am building you into a greater house. You cannot see it yet, but one day your face shall become sight. I am building something permanent in the pain. The latter glory shall be greater than the former glory. That is true for your body. It is true for your life. It is true for your story. Right now we live in in the former. One day it shall be the latter. He shall come. The trumpet shall sound. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It's like, um, as uh, to bring it down even a bit more, it's like the weather this week. How great has it been? You all seem happier. You seem in better spirits. You seem like you're going to make it. Uh, it's February. We're getting close. Uh, it's just been amazing. I mean, we're out with the girls, which is always good when you have young kids to be outside and just let them roam and do whatever they need to do versus being inside and wanting everybody to kill each other. And so being outside is great. And it's just, it's amazing. It isn't, isn't amazing. Um, just the weather, the warmth, the sunshine. Now, are, are we uh, still, uh, meteorologically, whatever the word would be, uh, in winter class? Yes. All right. Just so we're clear, we're in winter. It's still winter. All right. Everyone on the same page. It, it is still, it is still winter. But what, what are we experiencing today and this week? What's it feel like? It feels like spring, doesn't it? Now, wait a second. Spring doesn't happen until March 21st. How is that possible? Well, I don't know, but it's happening, isn't it? What if the future comes right into the present and gives us an ability and a power to stand in the midst of our sorrows, awaiting the joy that's to come. Well, it's not a what if, it is. That is, that is what it is. That's what Jesus' arrival is all the kingdom of God. It's here, it's now, it's a mustard seed. It's, it's spring coming right in the middle of winter and saying what? Winter will end. The grip will end. Spring is coming. You cannot stop spring. And you cannot stop the hope that is coming. The one, one day, 
one day we will see his face, and that animates everything. It animates everything. So it's a, that's a hold fast. Oh, these anchors for your life. The anchor, anchors, these anchors for your life. God is with us, and then God is for us. Both of these are so essential. And I will be the, the, the first to say, I know it deeply and live it. So I'm not up here being one that is just being like, yeah, so go and believe and have faith. I, I've been someone uh, many times uh, who's experienced deep shattering when I'd prefer none of that. And so I can say, yes, this is good, and yes, this is right, and I can still say, I'd rather not. As Catherine Wolfe says, you can give glory to God, and it can still hurt. Um, and I want to share with you a little background um, and just more of my heart this morning, so this will be a little more conversational, because I think it's important for you to know more about who I am and what, what makes me me, good and bad, because it will just will leak everywhere. Um, and a way in which um, a life I would never have chosen has become my life. And God has been even better than I thought he could possibly be. And I still cry a lot. Uh, two years ago, um, on January 16th, I preached a message called God Has More For You. Um, and it... God used it in some amazing ways to, I think, begin some stuff at our church, and I just happen to be the vessel. I happen to be um, the person God used, and this belief that there's more, that there's more available in Christ, that God has more for us, that we settle for far less than what's available in him. And I just, I had such conviction, such clarity. I was, I mean, I was just like uh, weeping for joy when God gave me that. I was at the Stairmaster at Planet Fitness when God gave me that word, <laughs> and I'm weeping on the Stairmaster which is okay because it's a judgment-free zone. So no one, no one there could even be like, why is this 35-year-old man weeping here? I had, such, I had such clarity on the message. I remember I text Rick, and I was like, Rick, I've got it. It says God has more for you. Because the message was going to be more technical, a little more detailed. Um, and uh, I remember just being like, it's it. And I was so, I have ne to this day, so never felt so overwhelmed by the particular presence of God in my life and in that moment on that Stairmaster in Planet Fitness. I mean, I still, I go by there, and I just, like, it is just a thing. I just look at it. I'm like, man, God, you met me here in a powerful way. And I was spiritually alive, and it was amazing, and it was great. And I was like, this is it. Like, I was telling people on staff, 2022, Mount Rushmore year in the history of Fellowship Church, this is the moment. And it's like, oh, up, I, got, I know, I wasn't saying up and to the right, but I basically was. Like, this is, it had our first encounter, uh, got moved through that, and then just like, man, this is it. Like, what now, Lord? What else? What are you going to do? Like, I, we are so ready to receive. We want more. Uh, and that Sunday, the 16th, and then, as many of you know, um, six days later, uh, my dad, he died. Um, and so the last, the last sermon that he ever heard was uh, that sermon in this room. And I remember uh, I was standing over there, we were responding in worship, and he came up, not a man of many, of, uh, of many words, uh, and he just said, man... That was quite something. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it was. I just loved it. Um, and uh, since that, that sermon, um, I had uh, just a very complicated relationship with it because I could not, not tie that Sunday to my dad dying. And so people love the message, walking in this stuff. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't want any, I, I did, could not even listen to it. And you can laugh it's a little bit when I say this. I was like, if I give a follow-up message, it's going to be called this, God has less for you. <laughs> um, because, because, like, I do want more. But I don't, I don't, I don't want to be broken open like this to receive more. And Jesus says, uh, unless a, a, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. And I think, yeah, but uh, I don't want to die. I don't want my dad to die. 
I don't want anybody to have to walk through it. So is, is there a way, Lord, that we can get just enough of you and bypass all the pain or have just enough of the pain and suffering to say we've had some of that and not have the, the, the levels and the layers of it? Is there not a way to do, to do that, Lord? Because I do want you. I, I want your glory to come, but not at the cost of this and the grief and the pain uh, that you walk through and all the ways. And so many of you, you know it. And there's story after story like, Lord, is there any other, any other way? And God just says, this is the way. You, you want more. It's in the breaking. It's in the shattering. That's where the shaping comes. And so you live with the tension of, God, I don't want this at all. Is there any way you can take this cup from me? I'd rather not walk up that hill. And then you have to surrender and say, but not my will, but yours be done. Because your will is the way. And I want more of you. What's the promise, right? The promise is his presence. The promise is that he walks with us. The promise is that he's there. The promise is that he sees when I cry, when you cry, when you weep. He knows He knows what's going to happen. He sees it, and he says, I am here. And maybe you can't see now, but one day you will understand everything. Look at me. Everything I have ever done is for your good in the end. There is no plan B. And you cannot conceive what I have prepared for you. We can build a church on people like that. And praise God, we have a church filled with people who can testify. You know what I also didn't expect? How good he is. How kind he is. How loving he is. How in the midst of this diagnosis and this pain and just the daily stuff of life, he is there knocking, 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 knocking. I'm here. And so I believe it more now than I did two years ago. Through tears and through pain, there is still more. But it's not going to come the way I thought two years ago. It's going to come through loss. If you want breakthrough, get ready to be broken. If you want more revelation, get ready to ramp up repentance. That's what 21 days of prayer and fasting were all about. We just wanted to lay bare. And I think many of you that participated were like, at first it was ugly. Not just not having things I wanted, but what came out of me. When all the stuff I looked to, I couldn't go grab. Oh, that's a gift of God. I I, I didn't expect us to have 800 people sign up for a prayer and fasting initiative. Hear me say prayer and fasting. (laughs) And I know most people are like, I don't even have a clue what I'm doing. I'm saying, yes, I'm in. And then you get into it day one. You're like, no, I'm out. I can't, this is not it. I don't like the direction we're going. And yet so many said yes. And we had 24-7 prayer. And you could track in the calendar the prayer online. And, and it was 30-minute shifts and an hour shifts. And from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m., it was filled with people praying for this church and for God's movement at 2.30 a.m. and 3.30 a.m. at 5 a.m. Just saying, we are going to seek his face morning, noon, and night. And we are going to keep the watch over this church and in this place. We're going to do that. There's the caliber and the level of people in this church. And that's available to not superheroes, not super saints, to you and I. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm in. Would you use me? Would you use, would you use me even in the breaking and the pain, Lord? I want to seek your face. Um, we made a video, so you don't have to just hear it from me, of people that walk through 21 days of prayer and fasting to capture some of what God did. And I really wanted to play the whole video that you could see it. Um, and get a sense of, from different types of people, what God did in their life. Um, And then we'll move into communion. So let's watch this together. For me, the the season of prayer and fasting has been hard seeing, you know, some of the stuff that's in me that I don't want to see. Where I get my comfort from is I've realized more and more that that Jesus is my comforter, that the Spirit's my comforter. But before, just to realize I was getting comfort from different things. If you know me, I love candy. I've got candy in my car. I've got candy at work. I've got candy at home. Um, (laughs) So I've not had it in a few days, so I'm missing it. Now it's the time when that 
urge or when I normally would have eaten this or that. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to go spend time in the Word or in prayer. And I think my attitude <laughs> towards my wife and my kids has been better. I've been more patient. Um, I think I've been more loving and kind towards them. My wife and I work with kindergartners, and I know that, you know, spending time with them uh, two weeks ago before the snow, you know, it was one of the richest times we've had. I will say it was not easy starting out. I chose to fast from social media, fast food and sweets, and I was really gung-ho, excited. Day one came and it was awful. <laughs> I don't like cake, and I, all I wanted was cake, and like the physical need to have those things was overwhelming, and I was very discouraged, um, very irritable towards my family, and um, honestly didn't really feel like praying a lot. The Lord just spoke to me, and He was like, you need to bring it all to me. And so I just went and I got on my knees in my bedroom, and I just laid it all at his feet. And he was so sweet to reveal um, just that I was using those things to fill the parts in me that needed him. And he also revealed idols in my life um, that I had kind of thought about, but was just like, nope, that's fine. I just had a renewed desire and renewed love for him and for just everything he had brought me through and that I don't have to rely on my flesh and the things of this world to fill me, but that only he could. One of the moments that really stuck out to me, it brought tears to my eyes, um, is listening to uh, Tony Shoemaker. I've heard Tony so many times with really high energy um, leading kids, but I got to hear Tony's reverent voice just um, reflecting on how good God is, on, um, on how much we can press into God. It's been challenging. Um, it's caught me by surprise. It's led me to just focus more. Being a stay-at-home mom with a one-year-old and a three-year-old, focus is not anything I do um, well. And so I've focused on my relationship with uh, my Savior, God. Um, who's always been pursuing me. I found him in just my ordinary life. Um, what seems maybe like an unworthy moment has actually been a moment of worship um, while making a peanut butter and jelly for Sam and Lillian. And whether I've been praying in desperation or um, times of sadness and joy, um, fear. I've prayed so deeply for my family, uh, my friends, our life group, this church body. To me, the season of fasting and prayer has been a, a chance for me to really evaluate and to reflect on where I am with Christ and where I am in my walk with God. I used to tell people all the time in discipleship, if God seems far away, guess who moved? I have a small group uh, Bible study. It's actually young women. And um, I challenged them. I said, are any of you doing this 21 days? And I have the spectrum of I've never done a fast before. I didn't even know how to pray. I had a young lady say, I've never journaled before. And so she's learning how to sit quietly before God and journal what God puts on her heart, things that she hears as she listens to the message. I think it's helped them in their spiritual life to connect to God in a new way. I would pray sustain, you know, that the Lord would sustain us. You asked about a specific word, so I would get sustain. And, um, you know, I was praying for some people that I know, you know, that are struggling, that are sick. And um, in any way, just that the, that the Lord would sustain them during this season. I truly have had um, prayers directly answered sustain me today. Just simple prayers. And He has. Um, and I have felt His presence in our home. I honestly think I've experienced joy um, going through the hard stuff, especially during this fast, because um, I've had a lot of heavy, hard things happen 
while doing this, knowing that the Lord is with me through that and um, that He sustains and uplifts me and that I don't have to rely on myself for things. It was raining when I was on my way to work and it wasn't like a downpour hard rain, it was like a light refreshing rain. And I was just like, God, I'm so thankful that you're like a refreshing rain and rain like washes away the dirt, the muck, the bad stuff, but it also helps things grow. The message that I keep praying over and over again is that we would have a holy boldness, a courage to do what God is putting on our hearts to do. God is good all the time, and He's put us in this place to do exactly this work. You know, you, you may be like, uh, I, I miss prayer and fasting. I didn't do it. Uh, or I don't, you know, uh, what am I going to do now? Or I, I'm too busy or I'm too, you know, all, all, all the things. And um, hey, I just, I just want to tell you, um, this morning is a great morning to say yes to him. Uh, here's the promises that are true. There's new mercy available this morning for you, isn't there? That's a promise. Why? Because we need it. Uh, there, there's, new mercy, there's new mercy this morning that's available in him. Um, there's reminded of being adopted by Christ. There's forgiveness for your sin. There's, there's a love of God to be poured out again and again and again uh, for, for you. It's available this morning. I just invite you to, to receive. I know that there are lost people in this room who do not know Jesus. Why, why don't this morning be the morning you say, Lord, I, I know you are seeking me. Here I am. And for all of us, we walk through hard things and painful things. We walk through the valley um, and just like, Lord, is this, is, this really, is this really it? He's with you. He's for you. There's more. Would you walk in it? Would you walk in it? Um, we're going to take communion this morning. Um, and in the book of Ezra, when the people dedicated the temple, the first thing they did was take Passover together. And remember all that God has done. And so we'll do that this morning. Um, and to lead into that, I'm going to read from our liturgy, um, which is a great entry into communion. And so I'll say the question, and then we'll all respond publicly uh, out loud together uh, with the, uh, the paragraph. Uh, ushers, if you're around, you can come up and, and get ready in your, your stations for serving of, of communion. So uh, the first question is, where are you? And we'll all say together, I... told you, the Lord, greater redeemer, he is the great I am, the Lord is and he is the God, he is good and he is true, he is holy and he is love, he is the truth and he is the word, the Holy Spirit and he is the David says in Psalm 51, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Let the bones that you have broken somehow, some way rejoice. Uh, the last text that I sent to my dad that he responded to was a few days after the sermon. And he was always asking about what people thought. He was like, give me the reaction, you know, just like so proud. And he was like, what did Rick think? And like, he loved it. I was like, what did Greg think? He was like, oh, you know, Greg. And uh, he loved it too. They both loved it. And I was like, great. And I just felt the Holy Spirit uh, say, hey, just, just make it personal to your dad. And I was like, oh, he heard the message. Like, I don't, and it just was like, this was Wednesday before he died on Saturday. And so I said, hey, Dad, uh, one, one more thing. Um, God has more for you, too. A little did I know how much more. That that Saturday night, he would, he would see his face. The, the latter glory is so much greater 
than the former glory. And this house, this world, will be filled one day with his presence and his peace fully. And as Spurgeon said, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me against the rock of ages. So we say, Lord, whatever you have, we're yours. We trust you. We trust you. Christ is in us. Christ is for us. And so uh, um, as we finish the last few weeks in Haggai, I'm going to ask you to uh, depart the sanctuary in silence. If you want to linger and remain, you're welcome to, and you can have your convos uh, outside of the doors. Um, There'll be elders and spouses here at the front. If you love to pray, the altar is open if you want to pray, and we'll be singing um, just for a little bit. So grace and peace to you all. I love you, and we'll see you next week.